Oh, uh, one other thing you could put, you could put um, questions or, or comments into the uh, comment session, the chat section, and I'll try and monitor that. And at the end, there'll be a chance for questions. Okay, are we ready? Okay, so uh, thank you as always, Charlie, uh, for hosting and for working uh, uh, on the slides with me and for your kind words. So today we are doing something uh, that I haven't done in quite a while, and that is returning to Europe, um, which is really what I enjoy most. So we'll, um, we'll start now. What I want to say is, as Charlie said, you can enter comments in the chat uh, and we'll get to that. But also um, about midway through, I'm going to show you uh, some questions and I think we could uh, unmute you then because I think you're gonna wanna respond to the questions. So, um, but you'll, We'll get there. So let's begin. I suspect most people don't know. Well, the, our topic is Anski, the Jewish Ethnographical Expedition. I suspect most people don't know who Anski was. Actually, Anski wasn't Anski. He was born Shlomo Zal Zal Zanville Ben Aharon HaKohen Rappaport. He was born in 1863 and raised in Vitebsk. Do you know uh, who his famous landsman, his uh, hometown bro was from Vitebsk? Um, Marc Chagall, but Marc Chagall came along a little later. If Ansky is known at all, it's for his most famous play, The Dybbuk, or Tzvishin Sveivelt, Between Two Worlds. Other credentials include author, Jewish folklorist, and ethnographer, political activist, poet, and pillar of modern Jewish culture. I think we could take a look at Anski now. That would be image one. See, very dapper looking, um, very dapper looking guy. Okay. His early life did not predict later accomplishments. His father was largely absent. His mother raised him in the tavern where she worked. He endured, and I use the word endured um, to give you some kind of feeling of suffering that he felt. He endured a typical hater education and heartily slammed the door on further religious education. As a young man, he left Vitebsk embraced the Haskalah, which we usually define as Jewish enlightenment, stressing secular education and Hebrew language as supplements to traditional uh, uh, religious studies. He got a job as a tutor in a Hasidic community. I'm not certain what it is that he tutored, maybe language, maybe math, but he was quickly terminated when the community realized he was distributing Haskalah literature to his students. To support himself, he became a blacksmith and hard laborer. These pursuits put him in direct contact with Russian peasants. Ansky's young adulthood coincided with fermenting Russian revolutionary ideas and the publication of Karl Marx Das Kapital. While he endorsed Marx's analysis of economics, he disagreed with Marx's um, uh, position that societies had to go through an industrial capitalistic phase uh, before emerging into a revolutionary society. Therefore, Ansky, um, rejecting the idea that we have to wait for this wonderful revolution and go through the capitalistic period, Ansky was ready to link his political beliefs and efforts to the Russian underclass. Abandoning his Jewish roots, he became a Narodnik, best translated as one going to the community. What community did Ansky choose? He went to Russian farmers, laborers, and miners. He wrote, I live very badly without a roof, food, or clothing. 
it seems that he almost enjoyed the poverty. Not only did Ansky identify with the Russian peasantry, he imbibed Russian anti-Semitism. He spoke openly that Jews were not a people, but a mass of alien parasites who spoke a jargon, slang, patois. Jews existed on the labor of peasants. And he adopted the Russified name Semyon Akimovich. He wrote, I'm quoting, the fact is I cannot find a solid foundation for action in Jewish life. I see only one possible solution to the Jewish question, to remove from the Jews all possibility of exploiting the population and especially to protect the defenseless peasant village from them. That's enough. I won't refer to Ansky's more chilling characteriz characterizations of alleged Jewish exploitation of Russian peasantry. His reputation as a revolutionary attracted the Tsar's police who expelled him from the hub of revolutionary activity. Ansky relocated to St. Petersburg where he wrote folk sketches relying on his experiences as a Narovnik working with Russian laborers. He denigrated Yiddish literature by referring to Shalom Aleichem as bourgeois and parochial. It is at this time that he assumed the name Ansky, S period A Ansky, in honor of his mother, Anna. Such a surname further denied his Jewish roots. Again, his activities attracted the attention of the police and he was forced to leave St. Petersburg. This time the destination was to the West, Paris and then Switzerland. If you have walked with me on the Grand Concourse, we stopped at a site just two blocks east of Yankee Stadium at the sculpture of the Lorelei. It is a memorial in honor of Heinrich and Heinrich, I always have trouble with that name, uh, uh, Heinrich Henne, a gifted Jewish German poet who lived in the first half of the 19th century. Why do I bring this, this, uh, bring, uh, this poet to our discussion of Ansky? Heine craved literary recognition, inclusion at German soirees and society. As a Jew, such recognition was denied. After many years, he succumbed and converted, hoping for acceptance. The result was continued prejudice and exclusion. Heine's response, I paraphrase, there is only one thing worse than being a Jew, that is converting. He lived a miserable life of always grasping for literary and social acceptance, always being denied, always guilty. Happily, unlike Heine, Ansky stepped back. I am not suggesting that Ansky considered conversion. He had no religious inclination, and as a revolutionary, religious observance was not necessary to be accepted just as Heine identified with German poetry, Ansky identified with the Russian peasant as a revolutionary. What led him back to the pale of his childhood and to take his place among the fathers of modern Jewish culture? The political influences of his young adulthood were tempered by the emergence of modern Jewish political and social movements, Yiddish literature and folk culture. 1897 was a watershed year for Jewishness and eventually for Ansky. The Tsar visited Warsaw in 1897. No big deal unless uh, you were the Tsar, I guess. Secondly, the Russians held their first modern census, which indicated that the primary language of Jews was Yiddish. Uh, there was a big change in the 1930s. Many Jews listed Polish as their primary language, but in 1897, it was still Yiddish. A Yiddish literature was emerging, emerging 
Isaac Meyer Dick, Mendela, Shalom Aleichem, uh, among those, and then, and then uh, parrots. You can't discard a language of millions of people as secondary. In 1897, the Algemeine Bund in Poland, known to us as the abbreviated Bund, the Jewish Socialist Party that advocated cultural, political, uh, and autonomy of the Jews in Poland was organized. The first Zionist Congress was held and Yud Lamed Peretz, the father of Yiddish, um, begins to write a universalist literary genre that placed the pale firmly within modern uh, European literature. So 1897 was a very important year. Anski returns to St. Petersburg in 1905 to find that the city was vibrant with Yiddish culture. The Jewish Literary Society and the Society for Jewish Music, both Russian publications, attracted readers and participants. He went to work for both. Ansky dived into this rich intellectual bubbling cauldron of Jewish society, Zionism, the Bund, and other political. Oh, you know what? Um, and other political activities. I really, uh, we really should show slide two. That is. Uh, Yud Lamed Peretz. I cannot read what it says on the on the bottom. It's too small for me. Um, but that is Peretz. I think uh, it's important to show images of uh, these early uh, Jewish intellectuals who who brought Jewish culture in, into the uh, modern period. So that's Peretz. So again, uh, Ansky returns to Saint Petersburg. Uh, it becomes very involved in the modern Jewish intellectual activity that is happening there, but not only happening there, also seeping into the pale. Shtetlach boasted, especially if they have, were a good size shtetl, boasted Zionist and Bundist branches, Jewish unions, sports clubs, and literary societies. To top it off, Anski was attracted to Shimon Dubnov's theory of Jewish cultural autonomy, which rejected Zionism and also rejected Polish and Russian assimilation, but called for autonomous religious and social organizations inspired by the spiritual values underlying uh, Judaism. So let's uh, look at slide three which is a period, there he goes. And that's uh, Shimon uh, Dubnow, who very much influenced uh, Ansky. So uh, based on what he finds uh, in, um, in St. Petersburg and all of the uh, many different activities that, that the 1897 uh, brought to Jewish culture, Ansky's Yiddish and Neshama, his, his Jewish soul, was ignited. And he began to say, Jews too were verbalized, were victimized by the Russian autocracy. And that Jews had a role in challenging the political economic binds that tethered the proletariat to poverty. Not that Jews were not in poverty themselves, Jews now were included in his revolutionary ideals. Ansky said, and a few contemporaries agreed, that he never jettisoned his Jewish roots and identity. He lived in two realities, a Russian Jew and a Russian revolutionary. Ansky affiliated with the Bund and wrote its anthem, Oshuva. Here is an abridgment. Brothers and sisters in toil and struggle, Heaven and earth will hear us. The light stars will hear us. We swear an endless loyalty to the Bund. Only it can save the slaves now. The red flag is high and wide. It waves in anger. It is red with blood. Uh, I was with a group of people not so long ago who sang the Shuva. By 1910, Ansky wrote, when I first entered literature, I wanted to labor on behalf of the oppressed, the working masses, 
and it appeared to me mistakenly that I would not find them among the Jews. Possessing an eternal longing for Jewishness, I nevertheless threw myself in all directions and left myself to work for another people. Sounds very apologetic. He continues, my life was broken, split, torn. I lived among the Russian folk for a long time, among their lowest classes. Things are different for us now. We have cultural, political, and literary movements. I believe in a better future and in the survival of the Jews. Earlier, I said, Ansky is usually remembered as author of the Dybbuk, but his greater achievement was the Jewish ethnographic expedition of 1912 to 1914. Actually, there were three expeditions within those two years, three or two years. Inspiration for organizing a scientific investigation of Jewish life in the pale originated with Dubnow, who saw the effort as support for Jewish life as a national idea. Remember, he, he believed in cultural autonomy, that Jews should remain in Poland and Russia, but create their own uh, societies. And in Yiddish would be the language. He established a Jewish historical ethnographic society in St. Petersburg that would research and preserve the rich cultural depth of Jews in the pale. Ansky's imagination was sparked. He would establish and lead an expedition into the pale in Shtetlach he abandoned years before this time to plumb and record the cultural, social, economic, political, and religious collective of 800 years of Jewish settlement in Poland and Russia. He confided to a friend, I have a plan now, and if it succeeds, I will be infinitely happy. I will try to get the Jewish Ethnographic Society to send me around Russia to gather folk songs, sayings, stories, spells, and so on. In short, folklore. If this works out, I will willingly dedicate what remains of my life to it. It is worth it. Ansky did become organizer and leader. Now the task was to raise financial support. Initial monies for the expedition came from Baron Vladimir Ginsberg. Baron Ginsberg in Russia? Hmm, strange, you ask. The Ginsbergs were very wealthy. Uh, they owned uh, railroads in Russia. Uh, and they also uh, very liberally loaned or contributed money to the Tsar. So uh, a royal title is a royal title, no matter how it's bestowed. With the Baron's further help, Ansky raised the additional money to support the expedition. The expedition had ambitious goals, to travel to 300 communities in the Pale. World War I and organizational prob uh, problems, and also uh, the funds running low, limited the investigation from 300 uh, communities to 60 in three provinces, Kiev, Volhynia, and Podolia. If we look at image four, uh, no, it's the map. There you go. Uh, it, that is, well, we couldn't get all of it in, uh, but you could see Volhynia, uh, uh, south of Volhynia is Podolia, and to the east is uh, the Kiev uh, province. Um, you know, the, the um, the pale was divided into what was called Gibernias, provinces. So these are the, uh, those three provinces, and they are primarily in the Ukraine. If you go to the, uh, to the top of the map, to the northeast, you see Vitebsk, where he and Chagall um, grew up. Ansky did not intend his findings to be filed away on dusty cracked shelves. 
for uh, future reference, his mission was to document the vibrant coast, uh, civilization that Jews of the Pale developed and uh, to continue to inspire contemporary daily life. Ansky reached out to a small group of ethnographers, for, for, uh, photographers, musicologists, and students, including a very notable scholar and ethnographer, Avraham Rechman, who, who wrote uh, a book um, describing the expedition. Uh, uh, it, it's a wonderful book, but it's in Yiddish, so it's not easy to go through. Here is an, ex, uh, an excerpt in English, of course, from Rechman. Wherever we came, we collected the historical treasures we found. We noted down tales, legends, sayings, and spells, remedies told to us by men and women. We documented stories about demons, dibbics, no good mix, lyrics, parables, expressions, and manners of speech. We recorded old melodies, as well as prayers and folk songs, and much more. Over 2,000 testimonies filled Ansky's suitcases. Ansky could not imagine that the civilization he hoped to present as a living, vibrant cultural organism would be rendered to ashes and shreds 40 years later. But I suggest that he was well aware that the impetus to cities from the Stettlach and Dorf, the Dorf is a hamlet, uh, was well on its way, and that a third of the Jews in the Pale were headed for the Golden of Medina, the Golden Land of America. His mission did, in fact, become a salvage document. In 1912, Ansky prepared for the first expedition. He and Dubnow shared concerns about the effects of the expedition's results. Would Jewish intellectuals and scholars and enlightened Russians, <clears throat> Russian Jewry, consider the pale backward in contrast to Western Jewry, Jews in Germany primarily? Would the expedition be viewed as a colonial intrusion to the pale? Ansky's leap into the work and belief in the importance of Jewish culture indicates he resolved his conflict. Moreover, he decided that the expedition would increase appreciation of Jewish culture. But how would the Pale receive Ansky and his crew? After all, residents of small remote Stettlachs and Dorfs were unfamiliar with 1912 technology. What is a phonograph? Or uh, getting a, a, this modest response to prying questions, it's inappropriate to discuss such matters. Maybe members of the expedition, uh, some uh, uh, people in small towns uh, believed were government spies or radicals. Avraham Rechman's journal explores this. Almost every shtetl in the Ukraine had its old women whom people went to for advice in times of crisis. These women performed magic with knives, socks, and combs. They poured wax and poached eggs and knew hundreds of ways to cure a patient. So we employed strategies to get these old women to tell us their charms. Sometimes one of us would pretend to be ill, take to bed and call for the healer. Another entry concerns the phonograph. In the eyes of the common folk, the photograph was considered one of the seven wonders of the world and its inventor to be a great brain. But for the rabbis, for whom it was beneath their dignity to be impressed by something modern, related to the phonograph as something insignificant that was only created to amuse people and whose pleasure from its music was like that which people derive from a mischievous boy. Music was a particular problem for observant women. The notion of kol isha, a woman's voice, um, men were forbidden to hear a woman's voice singing 
uh, inhibited women uh, from uh, sharing old folk songs or sing song chants. I made earlier reference to the thousands of ritual and uh, uh, cultural material items that Ansky Zemel, uh, Zemel is Yiddish for collectors, collect. To see the actual items, we would have to travel to the State Ethnographic Museum in St. Petersburg. Even that trip could assure we could not assure we are viewing the real stuff. Ansky's lists and documents are lost. Moreover, contributions from his collection uh, were supplemented by other collections. So it's really uh, almost impossible to, uh, to discern what uh, was Ansky's and what wasn't. For years, the Russians won't let anybody see it. It was all locked away. Now, now you can see the Jewish collection in St. Petersburg though. So what I'd like to do is look at samples of the kinds of things he collected. It may not be exactly what he collected, but it'll give us an idea. So if we go, I believe it's image six. Uh, okay, well, you know what? Um, leave this, this is not, it. Um, no, leave that for a second. That, that is not, that's Rech, the Rechman's book, the Yiddish Ethnographia in, in Folklore. And then on the bottom, it says Zichroinus Memories, Memories of the expedition uh, that uh, was um, organized by uh, Sh uh, Shin uh, Ansky. Okay, now if we go to the uh, image of, there you go, uh, amulets. Ansky collected many, many of those. Now, notwithstanding Jewish disbelief in magic, they were widely used in the pale to protect women in birth and to protect the newborn from evil. Other amulets were made against the evil eye, death and witchcraft. Popular decorations displayed the names of angels and demons. Now what I find something personal, um, in my family, there were three children. I had two oldest sisters. My oldest sister was nine and a half the oldest of the three was nine and a half years older than I. When she, she was born, my grandfather, who had already been in this country about 20 years, decorated the house with amulets. And he had older grandchildren. So I'm assuming he did that with them as well. Four and a half years, I, I, have, I still have one of the amulets that uh, he uh, hung in the bedroom. Um, Four and a half years later, the middle child, my other sister was born, no amulets. And four and a half years later, I was born, no amulets. So I asked my mother, how come no, only, only the oldest deserves an amulet? And my mother said, oh, please leave, us, leave me alone with amulets. Uh, but my point is that my grandfather was here for 20 years, still carried the, the notion of amulets uh, from the pale. The next uh, image is a ketubah, a marriage, no, there you go, a marriage certificate. This is a very ornate one. I have my grandparents' ketubah, or oh, what's left of it, uh, which uh, it was very, very uh, scant and, and very plain. Somebody paid a lot of money for this ketubah because it's so uh, lavishly decorated. And the ketubah lists, uh, it's an agreement between both sides and it, it lists exactly what um, each family is bringing to this marriage. It could be as prosaic as uh, the bride's parents are contributing to pillows to um, a very expensive dowry. Uh, and upon uh, divorce, for example, this ketubah becomes a very, very important um, document because it lists what each uh, family brought to the, to the couple. And then when they're gonna split, uh, you have to go by the ketubah. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a very important document and um, 
There are some women feel that it protects them very much. I, I interviewed a, uh, a woman uh, who said that wherever they go on vacation away for the summer, they go to Israel, she carries the ketubah with her. Uh, maybe as a reminder to her husband, I don't know, but she carries the ketubah with her always. Uh, the next image are klezmorim. We have two images there. Now, klez, klezmer, the word klezmer means vessels of music. It's almost, a, it's, it's almost as if it was religious. Uh, they were picaresque groups who traveled from town to town performing at very uh, social activities. The musician seated lower left in the top um, uh, uh, image is, is playing a cymbal. It's hard to see. It, uh, or hammered dulcimer. The cymbal gives the uh, clang or zets to uh, klezmer music. The next image, we have our gravestones. Now I chose this image rather than a close-up image of richly adorned monuments. Uh, the crowded rows of headstones of various heights and sizes, uh, their irregular placement seemed to me meta metaphoric of Jewish settlement in Poland and Russia. Um, like each one almost represents a shtetl. If we go to image 10, which is the interior of a synagogue in Poland, now you may be familiar with images of modest uh, wooden synagogues that dotted Poland. Uh, th that was the style uh, from the uh, 17th century into the 19th century. But I thought it would be interesting to take a look at the interior of this shul in, uh, in Poland. Notice the chandeliers, the impressive bima and an arrow. I think they rival uh, Western synagogues. The onset of World War I limited Hunsky's program to three expeditions. Based on his extensive interviews, observations, and collections, he wrote a volume called The Program. It is a list of 2,087 questions that probed the Jewish life cycle. Childhood, including uh, uh, the events from Cheda to marriage, wedding rituals, adulthood, which included family rearing and relationships, and finally, death. These questions revealed Jewish concepts of spirituality before life and after physical existence as well in death. For example, he asked questions such as, where does the soul come from? And remember, these uh, questions are based on the conversations that he had with people. Does the dead person's spirit linger in a house of Shiva? Well, obviously, people spoke about that. Major sections were devoted to women and men. These questions were never answered. The war interfered and the expedition was over. But it is clear that Anski already had the answers. Program is a fitting name for this volume because it sets a model for ethnographic research. Here are some representative questions. So we'll go to, uh, it, there you go. Now, I, we could unmute now because I'd like, um, if you'd like to uh, respond to any of these um, questions that Anski listed. Now, I intentionally did not choose those. Some of those questions would be exactly the same questions that we would, uh, the same question that addressed topics that we would talk about today. For example, what is served at a typical luncheon following a boy becoming a bar mitzvah? That's not an unusual question that uh, people would ask now. Or can a boy be called to Torah for the first time during the week as well as Shabbat? So I didn't choose those questions um, because I wanted uh, to 
uh, give you questions that were more uh, indicative of a um, of a, a Jew in a small shtetl in 1912 on um, on childbirth. Let me see. I have something else that I want maybe to show you. Okay. Anyhow, childbirth. Is it considered better for the woman in, ch in childbed that no outsiders should know when she's about to give birth? Now, obviously, this was spoken about because Ansky then phrases it as a question, almost like Jeopardy. Is it considered good luck to unlock all locks, to open all shut doors, drawers and dresses, to loosen the clothing of everyone in the house and to undo all buttons when a woman is in labor. Um, what beliefs exist concerning a child who is born circumcised? Is that considered a good sign? Now, these were things that, uh, anybody wanna respond to anything in childbirth? Okay, so let's go to Bar Mitzvah. When does a boy learn how to lay tefillin? All right, so that would be a question that, that uh, would be contemporary as well. Is there a custom for the Bar Mitzvah to give a Torah commentary? Is it a custom that until the signs from the tefillin straps have disappeared from the hand, the bar mitzvah should not eat. Let's go to weddings. Uh, I'm not, uh, okay. Is it a custom for a bride and groom who are orphans to go to their parents' grave before the wedding ceremony? Is it still a custom to dance before the chuppah, the canopy, on a broom? Who dances and what do people say at it? What is the reason for it? Is it a custom for a water carrier to meet the groom with a full barrel of water and then pour it out? What is the reason for it? Any question about wedding or comment? Okay, let's go to husband and wife. What kind of punishments and embarrassments would people impose on the sinful woman or man for example, leading them around the streets with a lung and liver around their neck. What words do people say about a couple which has gotten along well with one another their entire lives? So Ansky uh, writes over 2000 questions like this. You could see some of them really address very primitive practice and others are, are more modern. Okay, I, uh, you can uh, mute yourselves again, I guess. I earlier mentioned Ansky's participation as an Arodnik among Russian peasants and his indictment of Jews as perpetrators of economic exploitation and his subsequent embrace of Jewishness. Ansky's youthful flirtation as an Arodnik among Russian peasantry uh, and his commitment to Jewishness. No, I should really say despite, despite his youthful flirtation uh, as an Arodnik among uh, Russian uh, peasantry, um, his commitment to Jewishness was beyond question even though he uh, refrained from any kind of religious practice. This is evident by his own statements, his acceptance into Jewish academic uh, and intellectual circles and his actions. For example, during the early 20th century, Jews were forbidden to live in St. Petersburg. Those with connections to the court and government or who could afford to pay a bribe were given a permit. Ansky was among those Jews who lived there illegally, always moving without a permanent address. 
when a close friend confided to Atsuki that he had secured a permit by denying his Jewishness, Ansky terminated the relationship. Among Ansky's contributions was the frame of reference he formulated for the expedition. According to tradition, Torah and oral Torah were revealed at Sinai. Torah was eventually inscribed in the scrolls we know, while oral Torah later inscribed as Talmud and Mishnah, continues to be referred to as oral Torah. Anski uh, played on, on this tradition um, by referring to written Torah as an inheritance and oral Torah as reflecting, and I'm quoting now, the same beauty and purity of the Jewish soul the gentleness and nobility of the Jewish heart, the height and depth of Jewish thought, the same as written Torah. So you see where Anski was really coming from. He plays on this tradition of coupling written and oral tradition into a single corpus. Jewish ethnography into a single corpus, they are one. Jewish ethnography and folklore, the culture of the folk, was the new oral tradition, he said. Uh, let me clarify that by reading just one paragraph, um, which uh, clarifies this. Jewish life had undergone an enormous upheaval during the last 50 to 60 years. And the losses in our folk creations are among the most unfortunate victims of this change. With every old man who dies, with every fire that breaks out, with every exile we endure, we lose a piece of our past. The finest examples of our traditional lives, our customs and beliefs are disappearing. The old poetic legends and the songs and melodies will soon be forgotten. The ancient beautiful synagogues are falling to ruin or laid waste by fire. And there the most precious religious ornaments are either lost or sold to non-Jews. The gravestones of our great and pious ancestors have sunk into the ground. Their inscriptions all but rubbed out. In short, our past sanctified by the blood and tears of so many innocent martyrs is vanishing and will soon be forgotten. And so what he is doing is he's creating a new oral tradition. He's saying that Torah consists of uh, Mishnah Talmud and what we would normally refer to as, as the uh, oral Torah. And now uh, a new, a new uh, oral tradition, which was based on the ethnographic uh, 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 studies would, uh, that would be a new uh, Torah for, uh, for Jews. During the war, Anski remained illegally in St. Petersburg until 1918, uh, the revolution. While he expressed his socialist and revolutionary uh, beliefs out loud, he wasn't radical enough for the Bolsheviks and their communist ideology. Once again, he was forced to leave St. Petersburg and this time relocated to Vilna. He intended to move to Warsaw, but at age 57, died of a heart attack. If we could go to the last um, slide. Recognize the guy there. This tombstone is, uh, this grave site, um, uh, it, there were three people buried here. Peretz, Anski, and Dinesen, who was a Yiddish writer as well. He wrote what was supposedly the first best-selling Yiddish novel. And so the three of them are uh, buried here at the uh, cemetery in Warsaw. So folks, uh, I want to just, uh, for those of you who may have some interest, um, 
I will tell you that also in 1920, uh, the year that he died, the, um, the Dybbuk was produced in Warsaw. He wrote it originally in Russian, and then it took him, I think, five or seven years, and then translated it by himself from Russian to uh, Yiddish. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a wonderful movie that was made, and maybe we can uh, show it one day at the OZ when uh, when we can get together again. It's it's in Yiddish with uh, subtitles. So the sources for uh, today's discussion any any have come from uh, the, a book called The Dark Continent by Nathan Deutsch. Uh, and what Deutsch was doing was playing with the Livingston and Stanley uh, expeditions uh, in uh, Africa, uh, which were in Africa was called the Dark Continent because nobody knew what was uh, really there. Uh, of course, I mean, if you lived in Africa, you knew what was there. But you know, Africa was strange to the um, to the European world. So uh, Deutsch uh, plays on on the idea of the pale of people not knowing what's happening in the pale. And he calls his book, The Dark Continent. Uh, David Ruskies uh, has a, an article in uh, called The Paradigm of Return, Ansky and the Paradigm of Return, meaning, uh, you know, his return to Jewishness uh, in a book called uh, Uses of Tradition. Uh, then there's a, a very good uh, piece, uh, Gabriella Safran and Stephen Zipperstein uh, who wrote Ansky, a Russian intellectual at the turn of the uh, century. And I don't know if you can see this. Is it backwards? Uh, no, it's it, good. No, it's good. Okay. It's called Tracing Ansky. And it, um, it, it talks about what is left of his collection in St. Petersburg and all of the other collections that were um, uh, contributed by other collectors. Um, and I don't know if you can see this. I should have put it as well. Yeah, I think you can. Um, this is a typical Jewish family in the pale in 1912. They don't look like Hasidim running around in, uh, in Williamsburg. So very interesting. So if there's anything in the chat or if there's anybody who wants to ask a question or contribute something, uh, please uh, unmute. There, your there are some items in the chat. I guess we'll take a look at that. Sure. Okay. Um, there, there's a question from Joanne. Um, it refers to the questions you displayed in two of the slides. She asks, were these questions developed after having conversations with people? She's asking if people were interviewed. Yes. Yes. Now, I don't know that he, he never got an answer. And I don't know that he intended to get an answer because he already had the answers. And that's, that's why I say it was like Jeopardy. You know, the question came, uh, you knew the answer. And, and now he phrased the question that would, um, probe the answer. Uh, and, and that's why it's such an important piece of work as an ethnographic model, as a paradigm, because um, future uh, ethnographers were able to, uh, to use his outlines. So I don't think he ever really um, wanted an answer. He knew the answer. You know, I, I, this is just my own view. Um, when you were reading through those questions, I realized where maybe some of these Bubba Meisters come from. Exactly. You know, yeah. and, and um, I, I, I want to read a comment from Diane, which it was sort of Sedgwe, it, it sort of, well, anyway, um, she, Diane points out that most couples will probably match. So the couples getting along for a long time might have been remarkable. And it's, it's an interesting point too. Uh, can I refer you to Fiddler on the Roof? Uh, what yeah, did, I, have you ask her, do you love me? And she said, well, you know, I've slept with you for 20 years and bore five daughters and endured poverty and put up with all your Michigas. Um, so I guess I do love you. 
Uh, yeah. The the other point I wanted to, you know, um, you mentioned Fiddler and, and Diane's point and something you made. We were talking about in the Ketuba, how like if, if someone was giving pillows to the relationship, I mean, the, 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 the way of life was so, that we, I don't think we, at least in our community, we don't think about where our pillows are going to come from. We, we, we might be concerned about whether we're getting um, a junior four apartment or an actual three bedroom or something like that, but we, we don't think much about um, pillows or, or rice or, or where the chickens are coming from. Okay, because happily we're not living in the pale yeah. in 1912, <coughs> and and um, and we, you know, our refrigerators are well stocked. So, um, but there was, you know, uh, this was a problem that Ansky didn't see in his, although he came from from terrible poverty himself, um, he didn't see Jews as being uh, poverty stricken. He only saw the, the Russians as being poverty stricken and blamed the Jews for it. So they, you know, that was obviously as growing up, he had some problems with, uh, with self-concept. The, the first self-loathing Jew. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have a question from your cousin, Marianne. Yeah. Now, this is Jerusalem Post. I'm sorry. Oh, well, let's go to Diane first, because she's probably saying something related to this. Diane, you've raised your hand? <laughs> yes, I did. Thank you. I'm not, um, I'm not that good a monitor. So. No, you're doing a great job. So um, my understanding is that the like really traditional ketuba basically talks about the, the bride gets 200 zuzim in the, um, at the dissolution of the marriage, which if you do the math from Haggad Yah, is like a hundred goats, and and the, the value of a hundred goats. I just googled it today. Could be a hundred dollars per goat. Could be eight hundred dollars per goat. So it, at that time, it was probably a pretty good uh, monetary value. But I kind of thought that, and I'd have to look at my grandparents' uh, ketubas. But I kind of thought that that was sort of the standard ketuba, and the yep. idea that in in a ketuba that was found from the early 20th century. You have the, the you know the feather bed and the and the pillows in the ketuba is very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. You know uh, the rabbis said that a woman could upon upon divorce a woman had to leave with no less than what she came with. Uh, but you're right. the The idea of the zuzim was just. Um, uh, you know, uh, again, that, that's a kind of a primitive thing, I think, that was put in and, and remained in as just pro forma. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, things would, would be put in, for example, as well, that um, if, if the couple, if the boy studied, 18 years old, and he's still studying, then... Um, he could live uh, with the with the uh, girl's family for a period of five years, for example, and the the family would have to provide room and board to the couple, and this is the kind of thing that also went into the ketuba. So they 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 had the old pro forma formula, but they were also very concerned with practicalities of stuff, mm -hmm. and, you know. Did I see in the chat, somebody mentioned something about- um... Two more questions in the okay. chat. Okay, go ahead, yeah, let's do that. Well, one, well, let's get back to Mary Ann's question, your, okay. your cousin, because I sort of cut her off. Um, she asks, can you say more about Anoski's dramatic or fictional writing was popular in his time? Yes, he wrote, um, he wrote several plays I should have written the, uh, the titles down. He wrote several plays and he wrote, if, if you can, um, I forget the exact title of his other very famous book, um, which during the war, he did a tour of the, uh, of the Pale and wrote a book about how uh, terribly Jews were suffering uh, during World War One, uh, under um, 
Russian military occupation. So that book too, you could Google it and get the exact title, but he also wrote um, several, several plays whose, uh, I, I didn't write their, um, the titles down. The, nothing, nothing equaled the Dybbuk because the Dybbuk really went into Jewish folklore. Uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, if you don't know the story, um, the setting takes place in a shul. It's very, very dark. Uh, a young couple is uh, going to get married. Um, the marriage never happens and the young couple and the, uh, but the boy, uh, the groom is so distressed that he's not gonna marry her that uh, after he dies, he comes back as a divic and occupies uh, her soul. And uh, they have to uh, do what, uh, what anybody does when you have a divic. I mean, everybody knows that you have to be exercised. And there's uh, many conversations between the girl and the Dybbuk and the exorcism that occurs. Um, I heard my father who was in this, came to this country when he was 15, um, young enough uh, and, and just in time for the, uh, for the jazz age, uh, did not speak very, very much about Europe at all, but, um, he told me that he knew he knew people who were uh, possessed by Dybbuk's in, in Russia, and he, he, he was very serious about it. I need to add a comment, if it's all right. Please. Uh, my girlfriend, Faith Saunders, has an ancestor called the Grand Rebbe of Mirapol in Russia. Mm -hmm. The family story is that Ansky visited him to collect stories. And the Rebbe said, I will give you one about the Dybbuk. I don't want credit for it. You may put together all the pieces and make it your own. That's then, the yes, sir, I, well, I heard that. Well, okay. Yeah, I heard that's the source. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, there's one more question in the comment. Sure. Um, Joyce Novick is asking for a definition of the pale, which actually I would like to. I, I, I don't know whether to think about them as being a ghetto or just like a suburb of a main city. What? what okay. You know, at I, the end, at the end of the 18th century, Poland was attacked three times. Poland was the largest country in Europe. Uh, but a very, very weak country. It was the last country to adopt Christianity. And, some, and so in some ways it was very, very primitive. It was very large, very weak, and very, and now this is a contradiction of terms, right? Very, it was very democratic, which was its great problem because when I say democratic, the government was ruled by a very, by a non-effectual king, who, who, but it was good to be king because he was very well supported. But the real power lied with the people called the Schlachters. They were the noble people. The Schlachters met uh, each year um, in a Congress and they would vote on laws that were supposed to bind all of them. When I say the problem was they had too much democracy, if one Schlachter voted no, it could not become a law. So a Schlachter who's living in Southern Poland would suggest something that would be good for his region. And, and the Schlachter who lived in Wittebisk all the way in the North would say, that's good for you in the South, but it's not good for us in the North. So Poland is a very, very weak country and it's attacked three times actually four, but three times by Austria-Hungary, Russia, and Germany. And, the, and after the third um, uh, attack, Poland is divided among those three countries. And there's no longer a Polish Republic until 1922. 
when the Polish Republic is restored. Uh, Russia takes the area um, to the east, eastern Poland. And now uh, the Jews who are living there are not going to be considered Polish Jews. They're going to be considered Russian Jews. Catherine um, is the, uh, the, um, the czarist, the empress. And she is not going to allow Jews into the heart of, of Russia. So they are confined from Eastern Poland and that includes the Ukraine. They're confined to this area in what was West, uh, Eastern Poland, um, including the Baltic countries, uh, including Lithuania. Um, they're confined to this area called the Pale and Jews are not allowed to live outside of the Pale. So Pale really, and I think the word derives from the Russian, and it, it's, it, it really was the area of Jewish settlement. The Pale was divided into 10 gubernias um, or provinces, and there were large cities within the, um, within the Pale, and uh, small cities, and shtetlach, and dorfs. Um, now, if you live in Warsaw, for example, in Western Poland, that was not part of the Pale. The Pale is the is Eastern Poland. Uh, you know, one day we should also maybe do a class when we can get back to um, into Orzerua with maps and uh, and better definitions uh, that I could illustrate uh, of the Pale. When, uh, when Alexander the uh, second Tsar of Russia is assassinated and his son, the, the new Tsar Alexander the uh, third puts in very, very restrictive laws that um, limit Jewish life. Those laws are supposed to be called May laws and they're supposed to exist for two years but they exist uh, from 1882 to 1917 through the revolution. Jew Jews are not citizens of Russia until 1917. Uh, and part of, of one part of, the, of a, the problem within the pale, which is why uh, Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe begins in around 1882 for real. Uh, part of the problem is that these May laws restrict uh, communication, travel, um, and um, uh, business between the Pale and Western Poland. So if you if you lived in the Pale, but your brother and you own a store in in uh, Western Poland, if you live in the Pale after 1882, your brother may not forward your profits to you. So there's terrible and there's also ge there's geographic uh, dislocation, but this terrible terrible financial problems arise. Uh, and that was one of the reasons. So the not everything is the pale. Western uh, Poland was not the pale. Central Poland and uh, Western Poland was not the pale. Just the lands that Russia took. Uh, Austria-Hungary took um, what we called Galicia. They took that from Poland. And, and Germany took a part of um, of Poland as well, Northwest Poland. Barry? I hear you. One of the issues I always heard is why many young men came to America uh, in the, in the, during this period was because of the army. You got drafted into the army for 25 years. Was that correct? And, and you, during this period, the 25 year thing, Cantonists was only from about 18 to under Nickel, under Tsar Nicholas, uh, that was only Nicholas the first. That was only between I think 1820 and 1844. You were um, drafted starting at age 12, and then at, at age 18 you were so at 12 to 18 you're just a boy hanging around the camps and you're like a servant. At 18, you're expected to fight for the army for 25 years. 
Now, this was a horrific, but in, in 1882, that was not the case. Uh, Jews were drafted uh, for a period of time, uh, and, and Jews did come because they didn't want to go to the army at all. But going to the army was like, like a, 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 a death sentence, especially if you were religious. What, what were you going to do you know, for food? When would you pray? Uh, there would be terrible discrimination against you. Uh, that it's it's a little better in, in the 1880s, 90s, you know, 2000, 1905, Russian uh, the Japanese War. But uh, the real 25 year period is 1820 to 1844. Now that presented terrible problems for the Jewish community because. Uh, I don't want my kid to be um, to be drafted at age 12. Um, so what happened was, especially among the 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 uh, the leaders of the Kahal, the Balabatim, the big shots of the town, what they would do is um, the town would be told you have to um, supply us with with six kids. And so uh, I'm not going to send my kid. So what they did was they kidnapped. They called them choppers, grabbers. They would kidnap somebody else's kid and uh, send someone else's kid into the army. And this was a terrible internal problem uh, for Jews. There was a folk song written called um, Wisatsky's Tea. Wisatsky still makes tea. Uh, and this woman, this woman, the, the folk songs, she sings, come help, you know, help me, help me buy my Wisatsky's tea, and they stole my child. So that was, uh, not only was it a terrible assault on the Jewish community by the Russians, but it was a terrible assault within the Jewish community. This Mary, I, I'm yeah, sorry. Please. No, no, please. Uh, I, I understood that many times a boy's birth would be uh, would not be recorded um, for like two years to, to give him a head start when he had to be drafted. Yes, that's true. That's so we, you know, whatever you thought was your your grandfather's birth certificate or birth birth certificate may not have been true. That's right. Um, and have... the other thing, my my grandfather was drafted in the Russian army around 1905. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a, a barber and a felcher. And so he gave himself something that gave him rapid heartbeat. And wow. they told him to go home and come back in a year. And he said, see you around. And that's, he, right. then that's when he went to Paris. But the other part of the pale and, and is that my understanding is that Jews were, you know, as you said, very restricted, but they couldn't pursue careers. They couldn't become doctors. I mean, that's why, you know, the barbers and the felchers were like barefoot doctors. They really were not allowed to ad get advanced education. Yet my grandfather was a, an architect in Russia. So how was he able to do that? We don't know. What you know, some some um, it also depended where in the pale. It depended what year in the pale. Uh, the and uh, the czar, for example, Alexander the second allowed Jews to become. Now he's assassinated in eighteen eighty two, but he's. Czar for about 25, 30 years before that. He allowed Jews to become doctors if you could afford to go to, to college, afford to go to medical school, um, if you had such means. Uh, he allowed that, but it was a big deal, but Jews were not allowed to be lawyers. And it was a big deal when he allowed Jews to become lawyers. Um, you know, it's, there was no, people got around all kinds of things. And, you know, life was hard enough, unbearable enough. Um, so I, I don't like, and this is not me talking, but uh, Michael um, 
Stanislavski, who teaches or taught at Columbia, once said, um, you know, there were terrible, there were not as many pogroms as you think. There were enough, believe me, he said, you don't have to exaggerate. So my point is there were people who did go to school, people who did get higher education. Uh, it all depended when and where in the pale. Thank you. Okay. Um, did somebody have a question about matchmakers? No, 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 no. There's another question actually yeah. in, the, um, in the chat. Yeah. And then I guess we could go to matchmakers. Okay. Um, are records of the 1897 Russia, Russian census available to look at? Mm. The answer is, I think so. Huh? But again, probably in St. Petersburg. I ain't going. Uh, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but uh, I, I, I think so. Um, I, rem I remember that being discussed in a class. I think so. Now, if, the, if there was a question about matchmakers, maybe I misheard. Um, well, you can ask a question. That that no, it was, it was my comment that um, many uh, uh, couples were matched. Yes, yes. You know, uh, well, let me say, well, with couples were matched. Um, Sometimes match, very often matchmakers were used. Sometimes parents just did it by themselves. <clears throat> uh, you know, also Fiddler has distorted a little bit of the real image of, of the shotgun of the matchmaker. Matchmakers were primarily men, not women, because matchmaking meant that you had to, uh, not, I'm not saying there weren't women matchmakers, but matchmaking meant that you had to travel, uh, especially if it was gonna be a match between wealthy families. So, you know, uh, somebody who lives in, in, uh, in uh, Lishnoi, which was a shtetl, uh, they know that there's a very wealthy family and maybe there's already some uh, marriage with this family is somewhere in the Ukraine and the matchmaker would have to go back and forth. So it was usually men who were matchmakers and not women. But women were, were employed as, as um, were also consulted for matchmaking. And, uh, you know, Jews weren't the only ones who, uh, um, I was talking to, uh, uh, a young uh, Indian doctor who was going home to get married uh, really? to, uh, yep. to a, a woman that his parents uh, found for him. Yeah. It's so, still common. Mm -hmm. So it's still done. Anybody else? Uh, Barry? Yes, please. please. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. I just mentioned about 10 years ago. Rana and I were in St. Petersburg yeah. and we went to the Russian Ethnographic Museum yes. in St. Petersburg. Right. And we were absolutely shocked when we came across this fantastic, huge uh, Jewish culture exhibit in St. Petersburg at the Russian Ethnographic Museum. So if things ever come back to normal again and everyone, anyone that gets to St. Petersburg it's, uh, it's not yeah. something you think about when you go to St. Petersburg. It's a real highlight. You I know, really for, enjoyed it. Right. And I'm it, like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just mentioning when you talked about amulets uh, yeah. in the book, Cultures of the Jews, by, edited by David Bialy. He yes. has an extensive uh, discussion of amulets in Jewish history and Jewish culture. That's just right. mentioning another reference. You know, um, for many years, uh, the Jewish collection in St. Petersburg was closed and they would allow, the Russians wouldn't allow anybody um, access to it. Uh, because, you know, during the communist time, um, the idea was uh, Jews were Russian. And, you know, that was, uh, they, they, uh, they didn't uh, want to acknowledge that Jews were the main target of Hitler. Uh, Russians were the main target of Hitler. 
So uh, they, they didn't want to bring attention to, uh, to Jews in Russia. But now the museum, as you point out, is open. Um, and again, uh, Ansky stuff is there, but we don't know exactly what Ansky's uh, uh, stuff was. And uh, when, he came, when he came back to St. Petersburg, it was distributed to different places. Most of it went to the museum and a good deal of it, he kept, he never donated until much later. And then um, it, it came to the, uh, to, to the society. But thank you for, uh, for uh, describing what you saw. It, 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 it's, it's wonderful. Anybody else? No other questions? Okay. okay. Um, I guess we'll wrap it up. I, wrap I, I, it. What, what's that, Diane? Anything? No? Okay. No, I was just going to say this I, is...